So good morning. Thank you, Tur. Those of you who came out nice and early on this cold, nasty morning. I'm Mary Ann Kulo, as you just heard, and uh, I am a law professor here at Bentley. And this morning, I want to talk to you about what I call the business case for social justice. Um, my title's up here. So I want to start by just uh, giving you a working definition for social justice. I don't expect you all to be familiar with John Rawls, but um, this is just a sort of common sense everyday uh, definition I want you to have in mind as I'm going through my talk. By, what I mean by social justice is simply fairness. Fairness in access to necessities, wealth, opportunities, privileges in a society. And notice I'm not saying uh, equal access, I'm just saying fairness in access. The idea that business would be concerned about social justice uh, is a relatively modern one. Uh, traditionally, business leaders in this country thought that uh, any initiatives that would advance social justice were really outside the objectives of a typical business enterprise. And in fact, to the extent that uh, some initiatives to advance social justice um, might cost some money, they were actually antithetical to the business enterprise, which is primarily, of course, to make profits. So when the laws first started to push businesses to uh, engage in a certain amount of uh, social justice um, initiatives, the businesses kind of begrudgingly went along with it. Easy example of that is the anti-discrimination laws, right? And the early anti-discrimination laws were passed. The business community of the United States went along with it um, only to the extent that they had to. But that has changed, and, and that's uh, kind of significant for, for what I want to talk about. So here's a great example. There is still no federal law that outlaws or prohibits discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity. And yet, if you look at this little chart of uh, Fortune 500 companies, you can see that uh, over the last decade or so, um, more and more Fortune 500 companies have voluntarily included sexual orientation and now gender identity in their non-discrimination policies for their workplaces, to the point where today we've got 89% of Fortune 500 companies voluntarily having these policies. So what's that about? Well, it's about two different things. First, it's about a growing sense of some moral or ethical imperative to engage in uh, social injustice initiatives. And it's also about what I really want to talk to you about, which is a recognition that there's an economic reason to do so. So uh, for the last decade or so, some very well-respected thought leaders have advanced the notion that businesses really ought to care about uh, advancing social progress, uh, and so uh, there's been this growing movement toward corporate social responsibility. Uh, and the, the general gist of it is we can show you how you can still make money um, and not really lose any profits, maybe even make a little bit more by being socially responsible. And I totally embrace that. I'm enthusiastic to, to know that that's uh, a growing trend, but I want to be clear that that's really not my point. Those folks are saying, you can, you can be socially responsible without losing money. I'm saying you should be socially responsible because you will make more money, okay? Um, in fact, I have had the opportunity over my years teaching here to accumulate data to demonstrate that that's true. So how do I know this? Well, I've been teaching here for over 20 years and uh, when I first came and I wanted to teach civil rights, in a business university, I had to articulate a pretty good reason for the curriculum committee and then for the students to think that these topics were important and relevant to a business education. And I borrowed readings from history and philosophy and literature and sociology and psychology, and I tried to put together this really persuasive uh, picture of why uh, social justice issues and civil rights issues were very important for our society and for businesses. And you know, it works to a certain extent. It pulls on your heartstrings. Uh, you can see why uh, homeless people may not be homeless because of anything they've done and how society ought to take care of its downtrodden. And I could give you that speech, and I tried in the beginning. But what I learned really quickly in a business university is 
you get a lot further when you talk the language of business. And the language of business is numbers. And so over time, I was able to ferret out information that would support the notion that actually the bottom line would benefit from taking on some of these causes. So what I want to do with you is give you two concrete examples, because I know most people in the room are not unlike most of my students. And this all sounds great, but I want to see the proof, right? Um, so first thing we're going to talk about is investing in disabled workers. And again, this sounds like a really nice thing to do. Who wouldn't want to hire the person who's a little bit disabled to help bag groceries at the grocery store? Um, you know, it's sort of a kind thing to do. Um, and, you know, I put some numbers up here. These are February 2015 numbers, so these are a month old. And you can see that um, despite the fact that the Americans with Disabilities Act, a federal statute that's been around for over 20 years, um, seeks to eliminate discrimination against disabled individuals, uh, even though that law has been around a good long time, we still have a lot more unemployed disabled people than we do uh, able-bodied people. So uh, you've got 68% uh, um, labor force participation among people without disabilities and less than 20% among people uh, who do have disabilities. Um, you know, some folks with disabilities truly can't work. They're just too severely disabled to work. So it's not exactly apples and oranges, but that's still a pretty big gap, right? So what does this mean? The law is maybe not working as well as it should. Um, and perhaps that's because a lot of employers do everything they can to avoid even getting an application from a disabled person, to avoid interviewing a disabled person so they won't really run afoul of the law directly, but they just don't want to go there. <clears throat> And why is that? Because most employers who have been surveyed presume that hiring a disabled person will be expensive, it will be a hassle, um, and that at the end of the day, it'll just be an exercise in futility. The person won't really become a part of the, um, the, the corporation. And on top of all that, they're really worried that if they start to talk to disabled applicants, that they'll have to deal with the Americans with Disabilities Act, and that will force them to hire somebody who's not qualified, and then to spend all kinds of money doing something called a reasonable accommodation, where they have to do special retrofits to the office, and to the job, and to the computer for the person. So, a uh, little myth busters here. Um, this is what people think, but in fact, um, you only have to hire qualified workers, so disabled or not, the person's not qualified for the job, you don't have to hire them. You only have to make reasonable accommodations, which means those that are of minimal cost or impact to the company. If you'd have to rebuild your whole office or spend a ton of money, you don't have to hire the person. You don't have to do that kind of, that degree of accommodation. Um, and the fact of the matter is that most disabled workers don't need any accommodation, right? Um, when uh, we, we look through these numbers and the Department of Labor goes back and checks, most disabled workers actually need no accommodation, and those that need them, check this out, 57% the accommodation they need costs nothing. They need to be a little nearer to, their desk needs to be the one at the end of the hall. They need to be on the first floor. There's no cost involved. They need the parking place closer to the door. The 42% that actually have a cost associated with them cost $500 or less, right? So there are very few expensive accommodations for disabled workers. All right. On the other side of the equation, since we like to do these cost-benefit analyses in, in a business setting, there are a lot of benefits for, of hiring disabled workers. First of all, they have been shown to be more productive, more dependable, and more loyal. And this is not just me saying that, you know, with the image of the, the cheerful um, person with Down syndrome bagging at the grocery store down the street um, in Star Market. There are plenty of studies to support this. Um, the staff retention for disabled workers overall is 72% higher than for able-bodied workers. That's a huge cost. That's all that money you don't spend retraining and rehiring, right? Okay, so here are some specific examples. Software and data testing industries actually prefer to hire autistic workers because what they have found is that that intense focus actually is a business asset for them. So that goes beyond the general sort of retention and loyalty and attitude. This is a specific example. There are others of these, but I thought I'd choose for you instead some companies you might know. So Pizza Hut, right? Pizza Hut employs 3,000 disabled employees out of a workforce of 68,000. And 
it has found that since it initiated this program of openness to actively seeking disabled employees, the turnover rate is only 20%. It, was, it is 150% for able-bodied workers, right? You think about it, and a lot of people who work in Pizza Hut, it's, it's, it's a summer job, or you know, it's a college job, it's a part-time job, it's a job to keep you until your next thing. It's not probably a career for a lot of people. But for the disabled population that Pizza Hut has tapped into, they see this as a long-time commitment. And so the turnover has gone way down, saving the company a lot of money. Walgreens. Oh, let's talk about um, Carolina Fine Snacks first. Um, this is a, they had a similar experience. They have a very small workforce when they started. They only had 20 workers. And they had this horrible turnover situation. So at one point, they were down 10 workers, and they were desperate. So they hired 10 disabled folks from the community just to sort of fill the assembly line, just to get the factory up and, and operating, because it was a little sort of assembly line factory, small as it was. And they were stunned to realize that the turnover rate dropped from 80% to less than 5%. They also found out that productivity rose from 60% to 95%. And they found out that absenteeism dropped from 20% to less than 5%. So they decided maybe they should keep those disabled workers and not think of them as temporary after all. In fact, they were superior to the folks who had walked out. Um, and tardiness. Uh, disabled workers seem to be less tardy. Go figure. They're the ones that have to manage to go through all these inaccessible doorways. And yet somehow they get to work on time. Walgreens. Walgreens, um, huge national company. More than a third of their distribution centers uh, have disabled workers in them. Um, and, excuse me, a third of the workers in their distribution centers are disabled. And that is what I mean to say. And um, again, absenteeism has gone down, and turnover has decreased, and safety statistics have improved. And so guess what? Everyone's going around to Walgreens distribution centers going, what do they do? How do they do that? What are they doing? You know, some sort of secret training program. And, no, they just decided, oh, this works really well for us. You know, we train these folks and they stay. So uh, clearly there are specific types of jobs involved in each of these companies that perhaps not all disabled folks could do. Um, but uh, with a little work, these three companies found um, that it actually worked to their benefit. Um, and Walgreens plans to actually increase the percentage of their workforce to 25%. Now I want to shift gears. Um, and I want to talk about something totally different. Forget about employment and uh, discrimination for a minute and think about a different kind of social justice issue. Um, and that's domestic violence. Right now, this has nothing to do with hiring and firing directly, um, but domestic violence is a very expensive social problem. Right? It doesn't only impact us individually in terms of dollars and cents and, um, and mental distress. It also impacts corporate America. Now, um, a lot of people find that to be surprising. But here's the deal. 75% of victims are harassed at work, right? That has an impact on your ability to concentrate, do your job, be productive. It also impacts all the people sitting around you who are impacted and distracted by what's going on with you. Also, batterers are working as well. And guess what they're doing instead of working? They are harassing people. So 78% of batterers actually contact their victims through workplace resources. So they're on the computer uh, emailing and calling and um, bothering their uh, victims instead of doing their work, right? And they actually admit 48% of batterers um, report trouble concentrating at work, go figure. So the cost of this lost productivity between the victims and the batterers is $728 million a year, right? This is a number that corporate America has started to sort of open their eyes and go, whoa, this is just not okay, right? We need to do something about this. And historically, this was a problem for the police and social workers, but we have a lot of domestic violence laws, um, and they don't necessarily seem to be having a big impact on, on the problem. So what else? Well, um, there's an additional cost. So if that's not enough, there's medical bills, right? So victims incur an average of uh, 17, almost $2,000 more in medical costs every year. And if you add that to the lost productivity costs, then we're talking three to five billion dollars per year. It starts to get to be a sort of a crazy number. And you also have eight million lost work days, right? Where people are just not showing up to work. 
So if you add the lost wages and the sick time and the absenteeism, you get another $100 million in there. And all of a sudden, corporate America is going, OK, maybe we should invest a little money in this, right? Maybe we should actually do something that um, the public sector is not doing very well. Um, then what started to happen is uh, we started to have, I have this at work heading, right? Well, what else has happened? The batterers actually come to the workplace from time to time. So 94% of corporate security directors rank domestic violence as a high security problem. And incidents of domestic violence at work occur at oh, more than 57,000 workplaces every year, right? So what do you think happens? Well, murder is the second leading cause of workplace death for women. Um, you know, now you might think, well, of course, how else could you get killed at this kind of job? We work here, we live here. But you think about factories and all kinds of other dangerous jobs, it's sort of startling to realize that murder would be the second leading cause of, of workplace death. And what this has led to is some jury awards that have gotten headlines and have gotten corporate America's notice, right? Because if an employer is aware that someone has a batterer out there and that the victim has a restraining order that includes keeping that batterer away from him or her at work and the uh, employer fails to adequately protect their employees, that is grounds for a lawsuit for negligence, right? Fair or not fair, those are the rules. So um, if you win those lawsuits, you're spending hmm, somewhere between five and 10 grand just in attorney's fees and discovery and making it go away and settling it. If you lose, the average jury award I have up here is 1.2 million bucks. So you lose one of those a year and you start to think, boy, maybe we should invest a little money in the problem and just not have to have this risk hanging over us all the time. The other side of this, doing that cost-benefit thing again, is there is very um, little being done, even in the face of cheap alternatives. So we've got sort of 91% of senior corporate executives saying, yeah, you know what, this is a problem. But only 12% of them think that they should be doing anything about it. That's changing. Um, and you start to see, uh, if, if, I'm not going to go through this in great detail, that we don't have a lot of workplace programs in place um, there are very few that actually include domestic violence, even if they have a violence prevention program. But there are tons of low-cost things that can be done, virtually no-cost things that can be done, making people aware, training supervisors to look for warning signs, um, and moving toward uh, a reporting system internally where you can work with local law enforcement to um, raise red flags for um, people that are potential batterers as well as victims. Uh, there's a lot out there. And there are states that are starting to actually insist that businesses do this. At this point, however, businesses are starting to do this by themselves. So um, I just want to wrap up by saying that there are lots of other topics that I could have chosen. I went back and forth. We could talk about the high morale and increased productivity that companies who have family-friendly policies are starting to see. Um, you know, we could talk about um, the uh, additional benefits from hiring older, experienced Americans who've been laid off. Um, there are lots of different examples. Um, I leave you to sort of ferret those out on your own or to study um, in, a, in a course like mine. But one way or another, I hope that um, when you leave here, uh, you will consider the, the business case for social justice as not just, uh, social, social justice is not just something um, that happens to be the right thing, it happens to also be a profitable thing. And so I really see it as a win-win. Thank you.